Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to our first session for the Planners for Health project, Assessing the Healthy Communities Landscape. It's so great to have you with us. There's a lot of you here in the room. Um, nearly 200 of you are watching and listening, and I'm happy to welcome you. My name is Anna Ricklin. I'm the manager of APA's Planning and Community Health Center, and I'm here with my team, Elizabeth Hardig and Eliza Norcross, and we are going to have a great webinar today uh, launching the project, which just started last week. I'm going to share some brief remarks uh, before introducing our panelists and diving into the content, uh, and then um, we'll have some question and answer at the end. So a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, you can raise a hand if you have questions or concerns throughout the webinar, and you can always chat us as well in the chat box. Um, will be if you have any issues um, with audio or whatnot, uh, and questions as well. We'll be looking to questions in the chat box, and hopefully um, at the end you can. We're going to transition into a conversation with participants. So as we move through the webinar, please collect your questions and thoughts and discussion points to share. And at that point, you'll also have the option to enter your audio pin so you can actually speak. Um, that's what we're going to aim to do: is have a little bit of voice interaction. Um, at the end of this uh, lesson. So, uh, and I'll give you a quick reminder about that at the end too. So, uh, a little bit of context about the, the overall Plan for Health project and Planners for Health. Uh, we are um, operating the project through the Planning and Community Health Center. Um, it's a great resource for lots of information about planning and public health. Our website is there at the bottom. So I encourage you to look at that and share it. Um, we've been working on planning and public health issues at APA for quite a while. Uh, the Planning Community Health Center was founded in 2008 along with two other uh, centers of research and learning at APA. Uh, but we've been working on this for um, about since 2000. So it's um, really exciting to be able to advance this project with uh, advance our efforts around planning and public health with Plan for Health and now with Planners for Health. We really think it's a smart investment. Planning is the overarching umbrella for all of the fields and all of the ways that we live our lives. And we see planning as a convening profession for um, all of the topics that are very important to people. And public health is at the core of that. And improving public health is one of the uh, in our code of ethics for planning and is one of the reasons that planning was founded, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, so we think this is a, a wonderful way to broaden the work and engage more people in the work. Some of you may know these two characters, Frederick Law Olmsted and Jane Addams, were living and working at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted is a famous landscape architect, but he was also um, a little known fact, he was also the country's first Surgeon General during the Civil War. And Jane Addams, of course, is a um, social reformer and urban planner who embodied the social advocacy roots of the planning profession through her work with the Hull House in Chicago. She was a tireless advocate for the needs of women, children, immigrants, the poor, and public health. And together with the concepts of landscape architecture where the uh, Frederick Law Olmsted's aim was to have people be able to get out in nature and enjoy fresh air and get away from overcrowding and the same kind of goals uh, that Jane Addams aspired to with um, health and equity. We consider these folks um, to be the founders of planning and public health um, in our country to some extent and looking to them as, as the core of bringing together these two fields which then diverged somewhat in the 20th century. And so now in the 21st century, we're bringing them back together and looking back to these uh, health and equity aims as we're looking uh, to advance the Plan for Health and Planners for Health project. Now, some of you have worked on Plan for Health, and uh, we welcome you back as, as people involved in Planners for Health. Uh, Plan for Health over the past couple of years um, was APA's first major investment in the planning and public health connection uh, with place-based capacity building work. We had 35 coalitions um, made up of planning and public health professionals supporting work across the country. And in our second cohort of Plan for Health, our coalitions are wrapping up now. Our first cohort wrapped up last spring. 
So with the 28 chapters that are now involved in Planners for Health, we want to advance even more and build the capacity at the chapter level to incorporate health into planning work. Our projects can benefit from some of Plan for Health's lessons learned, and we have a few of our uh, key takeaways that we're thinking about as we've been shaping the Planners for Health project. One is a story of empowerment, with public health professionals realizing that they could have a say in how cities are created, planners making the connection between health and safety, things like sidewalk width as a factor in reducing obesity, and there's an opportunity to strengthen and increase community engagement for both professions. And the movement, the overall movement of bringing these fields back together. We know that planners bring a unique understanding to the broader healthy communities movement and can help demonstrate return on investment and engage a range of stakeholders. Like I said, the planners are the conveners. As we look to build our case for investing in healthy communities. We've also seen potential impact. The power of policy systems and environment changes, those upstream interventions, to improve population health and the broad reach of professional organizations and associations. So we see APA and our partner, the American Public Health Association, as really important because of our national reach through our chapters and our affiliates. So we'll be talking about these lessons learned throughout uh, each of our webinars uh, that we'll be offering through Planners for Health and, um, and look to build upon those and look to have you uh, share even more of your lessons learned as we progress. So now I'd like to turn it over um, before we dive into our place-based example of exactly uh, what I just talked about. I'd like to turn it over to our two colleagues from the Prevention Institute, which is a nonprofit organization building a movement to transform communities that support health, equity, and safety by bolstering the conditions and factors that foster resilience and well-being. We've worked with Rachel Bennett and Sandra Vera to design the Planners for Health curriculum and we're excited to have them present us with us today. Rachel works collaboratively with partners on research, policy advocacy, and technical assistance related to healthy, equitable community development and health and health policies. She has a dual master's in planning and public health from the University of California in Los Angeles and an undergraduate, undergraduate degree in psychology from the University of California, Davis. She's committed to promoting social justice through the framework of public health. And Sandra Vera is, Vera is a graduate of the University of San Francisco with a master's in public administration and policy with an undergraduate degree in political science from California State University. And she works to promote safety and healthy communities through projects focused on improving the built environment, increasing equitable opportunities for physical activity and play, which I love that part of it, and increasing capacity across communities in the area of primary prevention. So with that, I will turn it over to Rachel and Sandra and passing you the tools to do so. Oh, thank you so much, Anna and Elizabeth um, and Eliza and your entire team at, um, uh, at APA. We're very excited um, to be part of this uh, webinar and um, others along the way. Um, what you just shared and, and the history that you um, gave us a, an overview of is incredibly valuable and important to us um, as individuals and as an organization. Um, Prevention Institute um, for uh, the past two decades has been exploring and addressing the factors that shape people's health in the first place. And everything that you mentioned really speaks to us. It's what we've learned, it's what we've heard, it's what we've experienced um, as important opportunities to support communities and to support people in, in being healthier. So you know, efforts from, from many health agencies to improve health have focused on changing individual behavior through education and awareness, but our focus, like those of many of our partners and many of those um, on this webinar and this call, um, is focused on influencing the broader environments and systems that shape people's behavior and choices to be healthy. So we're excited to bring this thread um, in, in this conversation and in others. Um, what we've come to understand from data, both quantitative and qualitative, is that our environment, those places and spaces um, where people live, work, and play, as many of you already have heard and, and um, really are aligned with, um, shapes our health. 
often much more than our genetics or our access to medical care do. So um, this, this image that we're showing now um, really helps to kind of clarify, you know, what, what we have learned um, over the last two decades and what the, the field has really come to learn and to embrace in some ways around why a focus on changing behaviors and really changing the environment in which people make behaviors is important. It's overwhelmingly the, the factor that influences health. Um, so this plays out as inequities in health and safety outcomes such that we see large differences in life expectancy within communities that are just a few miles away from each other. So um, many of you might be familiar with this type of um, uh, media platform communications. This one is an example from the California Endowment that really kind of brought the data to light. Um, and how in different zip codes, many of which are, you know, right next to each other, life expectancy can change um, and be different and there be a gap of more than 10 years. Um, and so why is that the case? Um, I think what we want to do and explore in this conversation are ways in which uh, planning and public health can work to address the root causes of these inequities and um, come together to figure out ways to address them in a way that's comprehensive um, and that is supportive of the communities um, that we are working with. So another way that we think about this and that we talk about this with partners is that decisions that, that you are making in your day-to-day -day work, decisions that are made in the land use system or on transportation work or on zoning or community design, those decisions and investments made in those fields, they influence not just our sort of population level exposure to toxins and pollution, but they also really influence the degree to which health promoting resources are available to community residents. So these are things like um, how much access people have to clean air and whether it is easier or more difficult to drive versus walking, biking, or taking public transit. Our decisions and investments influence why some neighborhoods have parks, for example, and others don't, or why in some places we see more fast food outlets than grocery stores. It also influences things like who can access loans to buy homes, or start businesses in communities. And what we've seen really at a global level from the World Health Organization playing a leadership role and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as well as national organizations like APA and the American Public Health Association is that there are a number of factors that influence people's likelihood of being healthy and safe. They sort of are collectively referred to as the determinants of health. And the World Health Organization has really pointed out that structural drivers are a key determinant of health. And we mention this because um, this is some of what we're going to be speaking about pushing back against through the decisions and investments we make. What I mean by that and by structural drivers is really forces like the distribution of power, of resources, of money and opportunity, even things like medical services and access to health care, these directly influence people's health. And one way that they do that is by shaping the conditions of the communities where people are born, where they grow up, where they live and learn and work every day. So those of us who work on community conditions, planners and public health folks and our many, many allies and colleagues, it gives us the opportunity in our day-to-day -day work, in our decisions, in our investments as a field to push back against some of those forces that we know can erode people's health in inequitable ways and really strengthen those conditions to support health at the local level, at the regional level, state level, national, and even globally. And the way that we have come to think about this as our field has evolved is really that policies and practices in our field of planning and transportation and so on, they have in many ways limited entire communities from being healthy. And that we who work on community conditions, we can now re-engineer our policies and our practices, really the way we do our work to create opportunities for health 
for all communities. So we're going to spend the next six months really as a learning community talking about that. We're going to talk about some of the things that that'll require, partnerships across sectors and with communities. We're going to talk about what it's going to take to build our skills and capacities in the field. We're going to talk about the strong messaging that's needed to communicate the importance of our work and the value of our work and what it's going to take to develop the political will and creative funding to reach health equity for all. Thanks, Rachel. I think that really helps to sum up why we think it's important that we're here, that we're all together and having this discussion. And we want to make sure, you know, that this is a space that feels really valuable to you all because so much of the work is happening um, at the local level, whether we mean, you know, local towns and cities or regions or even states. There's a huge opportunity there. And we know that there's a lot of traction around things like healthy, equitable transportation, um, where planners and public health practitioners are thinking together about how to promote physical activity through complete streets policies, for example. Um, we're seeing lots of innovative work around rezoning land, allowing for more dense, mixed use, more community ownership of green spaces so kids have safe places to play, um, and elders have inviting places to socialize. Um, you know, one thing that really came up for me in thinking about the work that many of you are involved with um, are just the various threads and opportunities that are coming up um, in cities and in communities that experience their own arc of opportunity and challenge over time and how really um, it's important to align those local regional state priorities um, with the strategies and the tools and frameworks that will feel most important. So I wanted to, to bring up the example um, that has come up from Wichita, Kansas, which like many cities across the country um, is uh, seeing an aging of their community and also seeing on the sort of social side that a significant number of grandparents who provide regular care for their grandchildren, sometimes because they are babysitting and taking care of um, kids and uh, teens while parents are at work, and in some cases while many are actually raising their, their grandchildren. Um, and so in uh, 2013, um, local efforts that were supported by the AARP of Kansas working with the city of Wichita um, really thought it'd be an important priority of the community to create a, a place and a space where people of all ages could come together for healthy, safe play. So the idea um, really championed by the mayor at the time, Mayor Carl Brewer, um, the Parks and Recreation Department, local agencies, and community uh, community-based organizations were to come together to raise funds to um, utilize some empty space and convert two empty lots into a park um, that would feature exercise stations that were geared uh, toward people ages 50 and older that would also have a playground for children, paved trails, and park benches, um, and that would really serve as a space for um, multi-generations of community to come together. Um, and we think this is such a great example of the work that is already happening and the work that many of you are wanting to be involved with to bring this intersection of public health and planning to life. So today we're focusing on assessing the healthy community's landscape. This is a core component of both your Planners for Health project and the practice of healthy planning more broadly speaking. So we wanted to tee up some questions and considerations for you to keep in mind, things that we'll revisit through this six-month series. Um, so some of the topics that we'll be covering are um, on the screen. You see, you see that there's a breadth and a depth there, and we're very much looking forward to bringing in your own experience and insight into each one of these topics and to really underscore that they are aligned in so many ways. So while they're you know, framed as topics, they clearly work along with each other, and we'll bring that thread um, throughout. So in thinking about the healthy lands healthy community landscape, you know, asking questions of your of your teams and of your groups around, you know, why are things the way they are? Who needs to be involved in changing conditions? What's in it for them as well as what's in it for me? are incredibly important. So there's a lot of um, opportunities out there, and it will require partnerships with those outside of, of your own planning world and even the public health world. And we're all in it together to figure out ways to bring those partnerships um, to light. So with those big questions in mind, we've covered a lot. We're now going to hear from 
two people working at this intersection of planning and public health who have addressed these questions in different ways in their work. So following the presentations, we'll come back together for a discussion and begin to digest this a little bit more. So I have the pleasure at this moment of introducing Carla Blackmar, who is a project manager for the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. The Alliance is a collaborative of local health departments in Southern California whose members collectively have statutory responsibility for the health of 60% of California's residents. To give you all a sense of what that means um, in an area as large, not only as California, but Southern California, that covers about 20 million people. So we're really thankful that Carla took some time to be here today and to learn about her recent work that has focused on developing clear guidance on how to maximize the health co-benefits of investments and plans ranging from statewide grants and regional planning to local active transportation uh, projects. So Carla, thank you so much for being here and we're really excited to learn more about your work. And following Carla's presentation, we're also going to hear from Laura Deerenfield, who's joining us from Austin, Texas, where she serves as the Active Transportation and Street Design Division Manager, manager excuse me, for the City of Austin's Transportation Department. Laura is also a leader of the Plan for Health Coalition in Austin and is going to be sharing more about her Plan for Health work. Laura brings 15 years of experience in transportation planning, public policy, and community-based nonprofit organization leadership. And she and her team at the city have been working on a number of different things around healthy, equitable transportation, like pedestrian safety, bike network connectivity, and transit improvements. They've also ushered in dozens of new community-based events and classes that have been encouraging Austin residents to walk, bike, and ride transit. So we're so excited to hear about both Carla and Laura's work, and then we'll bring it back for the whole group to have a discussion. Thank you guys so much. This is Carla Blackmar. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Thanks, Carla. Great. Hi. So thank you for the opportunity, and I'm so excited that APA has taken on this effort. This is a wonderful uh, project that you guys are working on. So I'm here today representing, I think, what is a slightly different type of organizational beast from some that you may have worked for before or worked with. And again, I work for the Public Health Alliance of Southern California, which is an organization of, of public health departments. And uh, our model is actually based off of a similar type of an organization that exists in the Bay Area called Bar High uh, that's been around actually for, for a substantial length of time, I think since the late 90s. Um, our organization began in 2012 in response to funding that came from the Centers for Disease Control that really focused on upstream chronic disease prevention through policy systems and environmental change. And as our health departments began working on projects that were intended to really uh, change the way our communities are structured, health departments began to realize that um, some of these projects were far outside the purview of just our individual city health departments or county health departments and actually required some degree of, um, of regional collaboration. So as an example, if you think about a um, expansion of a, <coughs> of a freight corridor, that is something that often crosses multiple counties. We have two very important uh, ports of entry ports in our, in our region and moving goods between them and the distribution warehouses typically crosses at least three different county lines. And so making uh, significant impacts on large-scale planning decisions required our health departments to begin to band together and to think about how we could collaboratively address population health. Our Public Health Alliance vision that we developed when we formed in 2012 is that all Southern California communities are healthy, vibrant, and sustainable places to live, work, and play. And while we know that some of our communities may be getting close to realizing that vision, we, and we're bringing up the same graphic from the California Endowment, are aware that there are tremendous disparities between our communities. And because our focus is on population health, we are concerned not just with you know, health delivery to individuals, but with um, situations where we see significant differences in life expectancy between demographic groups and between neighborhoods. And really trying to get to the, an understanding and to to truly changing the levers of what influences our health, ex our life expectancies and our quality of life in our individual communities. When we began, we actually started just by looking at kind of uh, the basic recipe of health, um, our caloric imbalance. 
how much and what type of food we eat and how uh, we, what are, you know, whether we burn off the, that food with exercise. Um, so we started with just two initiatives, uh, healthy food systems and healthy transportation. Uh, hey, Carla? And our, our plan Carla? Yeah. Carla, um, are you advancing your slides just quick? I am. Are you guys not seeing it? I don't think we, we don't see that. We can try your oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me make sure that I am actually, you have because I'm showing there them on go. my own screen. Okay. So sorry. There we go. Uh, how am I meant to be advancing them? Because I'm not seeing that that's possible. Can you guys just go uh, ahead and advance it. them for me? Oh, I'm doing it. Okay. Yep. You. I mean, okay, they great. Are I'm so sorry. I was I was showing the presentation on my own screen and assuming you guys were all seeing it at the same time. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry we about out. that. Okay. Great. Thank you. So. Um, once again, we had two sort of initial priority initiatives through which we were trying to do this work through healthy transportation and healthy food systems. And they were supported by um, kind of getting to this question of assessing your landscape of, of health and planning by a data initiative that was really designed to develop metrics through which we could understand uh, both what the current state of affairs was in terms of health and planning and the built environment and also to develop uh, targets and goals for where we thought that should go. And as we've gone along over the past four years, we've added in, I would say, two kind of cross-cutting lenses on our work. One is equity, um, really beginning to realize that unless we are thinking about how our funding and our systems are disproportionately um, assisting some and disadvantaging, making others disadvantaged that we will not be able to realize our goals of broader population health um, and to really try to be conscientious in how we're addressing and thinking about funding prioritization and equity in all of our work. And the other that we've taken on is climate change in recognition of the fact that it is a growing threat and presents tremendous challenges to population health. And also in recognition of the fact that many of the strategies that are most effective in terms of delivering changes in, in terms of our population health uh, can also benefit uh, our efforts to reduce and prevent climate change and prepare for the uh, effects of it as it begins to unfold. An example of um, one of these co-benefit areas that we feel transects equity, health, communication, uh, transportation is promoting active transportation strategies. And this slide, I think, enumerates why it's such an important area of research for us. The co-benefits of active transportation are really substantial, and this is based on a study that comes from the Bay Area where they, um, they assumed that rather than meeting the greenhouse gas reduction targets uh, for 2050 through uh, you know, using electric cars or other means, that those greenhouse gas reduction targets were met through active transportation alone. Um, envisioning a very substantial increase in the amount of time the population on average spent walking and biking. And the population health benefits from that are tremendous, including a 13% reduction in cardiovascular disease, a 13% reduction in diabetes, a 5% reduction in breast, and breast cancer and colon cancers, 7% reduction in depression, and a 9% reduction in dementia. And projected out across an entire population, these types of disease reductions are <laughs> unprecedented and I think really kind of stand to demonstrate that if we were to be very ambitious in realizing our active transportation goals, that we could simultaneously address many of the challenges that we have uh, in our contemporary societies. At the same time, we know that this isn't as simple as it seems. With our current sort of auto-focused infrastructure, active transportation is often dangerous and unappealing. Many people don't have the resources to do it safely. They're in, in, our, in our communities that use active transportation the most, you see that um, we have very high traffic-related injury and um, collision deaths from sort of inadequate infrastructure. And so if we're really to begin to realize this vision of active transportation as a solution, we need to get upstream and start thinking about the many different ways in which our decisions impact people's decision and ability to use active transportation safely. Just to illustrate this, we've done some work about uh, what influences mode choice. And this may be familiar to many of you, but um, 
it kind of relates to the idea that in order to make these changes, we have to move beyond health itself. You know, there are individual level factors that control whether people or influence whether people have the option to walk or bike as part of their daily, um, as part of their daily completion of their work or activities. And those range from age and gender and physical ability. But there are other levels that are far outside of the power of the individual to change, including how safe their communities are, what their perception of safety is in their communities, whether or not um, the temperature and the climate is, is uh, comfortable for uh, engaging in physical activity, whether there are actually close uh, destinations that can be accessed through active transportation. And you know, again, these kind of basic um, things that influence our individual calculations about whether we can use active transportation are influenced by even larger uh, social determinants of health related factors, including crime and poverty, the quality of the streets and the facilities in our area, the locational density, whether there are coupling constraints such as children who need to be transported and whether that's something that's possible or, uh, or very unsafe through an active transportation mode. And so I think that, you know, just taking a simple example like this, something that we all know we need to do kind of illustrates the need for the type of organization that we've formed uh, to try to move these issues. Some of the challenges, you know, as we've mentioned, that our organization has tried to solve are these issues of uh, levels of government and jurisdictional mismatch. So, you know, again, land use decision making being held at a city or jurisdictional level where public health is typically something that's done at a, at a county level. Um, where counties do have some land use control, but are often not uh, the fundamental deciders of who gets the transportation funding or how it's allocated. We also see what we call the wrong pocket syndrome, where the externalities that are created by our transportation system, so you know, the construction of additional auto-based infrastructure, is not borne by the agencies doing that construction and is instead borne, for example, by our health uh, delivery system. So trying to connect the dots between basically what makes us sick and the, uh, the people who are paying for it. Um, and then other kind of, in some, in some ways, simpler uh, challenges that we've been trying to address include the lack of common language across health and planning and the lack of granular metrics that help us understand what the current uh, landscape of health and planning is in our communities. To begin to address these challenges, the basic kind of organizational structure our organization has created is a monthly working group that is, consists of our core public health department membership, and these are staff who typically work very closely on policy systems and environmental change work. And they get on a call monthly uh, in conjunction with some of our very important decision makers and the folks who are actually holding some of our purse strings in terms of how our programs are designed and where we put our funding priorities. And those folks include folks from our county transportation commissions and councils of government, folks from our regional metropolitan planning organizations that do our regional transportation plans, some of our state agencies, including Caltrans, our California Transportation Agency, and the Office of Planning Research, which is our uh, local planning, our statewide planning arm, as well as some of our very valuable nonprofit partners, such as the Francis School National Partnership and Prevention Institute. So we have both transportation, non-government organizations and health non-government organizations. And we all get together once a month um, because we cover a, a very large geography. We typically do most of our work remotely. Um, and we really begin to think about uh, how various programs and structures can support uh, the best health outcomes and really kind of trying to move the dial on the many different factors that we know influence people's ability to make the healthy choice the easy choice. So, and one of, I think, the most important things as we've begun to do this work is to try to understand um, a little bit like what Rachel was talking about, uh, the social determinants of health and to really begin to measure those and to think about, you know, what are the factors that are leading to this type of, you know, tremendous disparity in life expectancy between nearby zip codes and what are the things that on the ground we can do to really start moving that dial. So we've made it, I think, one of our primary ambitions as an organization to really bring the data. We noticed at the early days of involving health and planning that there was a tendency of, of public health to say, well, health should be at the table, 
um, but often a failure to specify what exactly we were looking for um, and what we thought would make the biggest difference. And so we began by thinking about what we call the social determinants of health, which is abbreviated here in the center of the circle. And um, again, those are the sort of factors that influence our decisions based on the places where we live, work, and play. And so they include things such as the neighborhood and built environment, economic stability, education, social and community context, and health and health care. Based on that, we've actually created a statewide index that goes down to a census tract level and uses publicly available data to help us understand what the, um, what the factors are within people's neighborhoods that influence their health. And also help us prioritize which areas may need the most assistance if we're going to be prioritizing our funding. And so we've based this off of our understanding of what the primary drivers are of health. Uh, one of the most significant drivers of health, as we understand it, is economic resources, people's, you know, whether people are living in poverty, uh, factors related to sort of their housing avail availability, uh, cost, and quality, their ability to access a car, um, and, you know, their ability to have sort of like basically the solid income and a solid economic foundation. Building on top of that, we add other areas including social resources, which includes factors like linguistic isolation, educational opportunities, people's access to health and health care, environmental hazards, and complete neighborhoods. And again, using all this public, publicly available data, we've created an index um, with various weights is again projected out statewide um, and is designed to help us understand which areas may have the greatest opportunity to improve their health through changing these uh, various levers of, of the social determinants. This is a screenshot of how our map works and it's linked here so if you get the slides afterwards I encourage you to come and peruse our tool um, and this is not something that typically exists at a national level at this time, but it is certainly something that your planning department, your city, your county could take on as a similar type of project. Uh, there are some similar projects out there, including um, the Virginia Health Opportunity Index uh, that you may want to look at. And really, it's a, the, the basic idea is, is not terribly complicated, and it's really just looking at these social determinants and pulling the publicly available data, layering it to identify where your highest areas of need might be. So if you click on an individual area, you'll see that it pulls up a, a wide range of the, the component pieces of the index and shows both um, what, the, what the sheer value is for each component as well as the percentile ranking which allows you to understand, for example, how your jurisdiction's housing costs or this particular census tract's housing costs might compare to that of other census tracts in your area and in the state. Finally, one of the things that we're working on with this project is connecting the data itself to policy guidance. And so, for example, using that high housing cost component of our tool, we're in the process of actually building out a guide that talks about what the indicator measures and then how it's connected to health. And then finally, and I wasn't able to screenshot this and put it in there, but um, what local jurisdictions can do about it. So I think that our hope is that if public health is very clear about what the components are, um, that lead to sort of uh, people being able to live healthy, productive lives, that we'll really be able to move it at a local level and see, for example, an increased focus on the provision of affordable housing, um, which is a substantial crisis here in our Southern California communities. So finally, I just wanted to briefly mention some of the outcomes that have come from our project. And um, I'm just going to that page. So I think that you know this is a constant work in progress, but through sort of some of this effort, we have been able to make some substantial accomplishments, including really identifying some shared best practices for health departments when they're doing built environment work. And that includes things like um, many of our health departments give out many grants to our uh, partner jurisdictions, our cities and county agencies for things like active transportation planning helping people understand how to structure that type of grant, um, developing healthy development checklists where there are clear um, steps that health practitioners can go through when they're reviewing plans 
are participating in um, broader efforts with planners to understand how to promote health. Um, and then just kind of generally helping our health departments move into work with cross-sector partners. The first time, you know, if you're a health practitioner that you go into a room with a transportation planner, it can be very overwhelming. Uh, there's a tremendous number of acronyms, as we know, in both of our fields. And so we've done a lot of work to try to make sure that we bridge that gap and speak each other's language. We've also had some success in developing metrics and getting them approved to advance health in our regional planning processes. Uh, we provide feedback to our MPOs on their regional transportation plans. And both of our regional MPOs now have uh, health elements within their transportation plans and are moving towards having specific metrics um, that measure their ability to promote active transportation and other health promoting, back, uh, health promoting factors within their long range transportation plans. And finally, we've provided a lot of input on state programs including um, working to preserve and increase the share of funding for active transportation, prioritizing funding to communities with poor health outcomes, and then designing programs that really maximize health co-benefits. So here in California, we have, for example, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, and um, there's always a lot of discussion about whether that funding should focus more on uh, electric vehicles or whether it should focus more on um, changing the way that our cities are built and I believe that we've been a consistent voice for really thinking about how our communities can have more transportation options rather than simply elect electrifying our vehicle fleet. So um, over time, I believe we have begun to sort of move the needle in our region towards, uh, towards a better integration of health into planning. Thank you so much. And I hope that uh, we can answer some of your questions at the end of the presentation. And then I'm not totally sure how to turn this over, but I'm going to give it a shot. That's that's great. Thank you, Carla. I've actually just given the keyboard controls over to Laura. So we're ready for you to switch slides, Laura, if you can. OK. Can you hear me all right? Yep. I can. Um, let's see. All right. I think I just advanced it successfully. Well, uh, thank you again to the uh, entire um, Plan Pro team at the American Planning Association for the invitation and for the chance to really um, immerse uh, oneself in a, in a fantastic discussion that we've just had. Um, I'm very much in the transportation realm, um, sort of building projects, and so um, it's really nice to, to be reminded of why we're building this infrastructure <laughs> um, and utilizing all of the really incredible tools, um, as Carla just shared with us. Uh, I think what uh, we were asked to do on this webinar is to provide some real experience um, from Austin on how we built a coalition of planners and public health professionals and transportation engineers and community stakeholders uh, to advance uh, best practice in healthy eating and active living uh, as one of the um, funded cohorts cohort, in cohort one um, for the Plan for Health initiative. So I would um, love to take you all through our experience, uh, share you know, how our coalition was um, put together, and what we did uh, with the resources provided from the American Planning Association, and then um, some of our lessons learned and sustainability uh, strategies that are really coming to, um, to life in, in big ways, um, even from uh, conversations today we've had with our partners in um, the Office of Sustainability. So uh, with that, I'll just share a little bit about what it is we took on as our as our plan as the Plan for Health Austin Coalition. Um, we uh, the principal partners in this effort were the City of Austin's Office of Sustainability, and they led a district food planning effort. Um, this is based on best practice in food planning. Um, from cities like uh, Vancouver, Canada, um, Edmonton, and uh, other cities in the US um, Northwest, and really looking at how to um, identify the whole entire life cycle of the food system, how it is um, produced, how it is uh, brought into the community, uh, distrib distributed, accessed by people, consumed, and then um, the whole waste and recovery cycle. 
And then uh, my team at the Austin Transportation Department uh, initiated a first, really first in the state of Texas, we believe, um, transportation options program called um, Smart Trips. And some folks on the call may be familiar with successful Smart Trips uh, programs throughout the U.S., um, notably in Portland, Oregon, um, Chicago, and other cities. Um, Austin uh, is a very um, sprawled city, over 300 square miles. Um, and we were working in, um, in a particular area in the north, um, sort of north central part of the city. Um, one of the two most um, uh, disparate areas in terms of health outcomes and um, one that uh, had a lot of uh, transit use and, uh, and walking as well, um, not as much biking, but um, an area that we really wanted to encourage um, more active transportation uh, through, this, through this program. So our main goals uh, were to increase physical activity through, through this Smart Trips program and then in improve access to nutritious food through this neighborhood food systems uh, planning program. And all of this was um, really led by our city's um, comprehensive plan um, called Imagine Austin that called for um, increasing local food production, decreasing food insecurity, and then supporting an affordable and healthy community by um, providing a safe transportation network which integrates physical activity into daily life. So moving on to the next slide. Hopefully that works. Oops, went one too far. So this diagram attempts to explain sort of how we all worked together under the Plan for Health grant. We really were committed to pursuing both a food, um, healthy eating strategy as well as an active living strategy. Um, so my team in the, on the, um, the left side, the red um, boxes, uh, we were the ones pursuing the transportation options program. And then Edwin Marty, my colleague in the Office of Sustainability here at the City of Austin, his team was pursuing this um, district food-based um, planning effort. So uh, we, we essentially engaged in sort of a three-part um, or a four-part strategy um, in slightly different ways. Um, the food systems effort was really a planning effort and the active transportation side was really a programmatic effort. Um, but we really didn't know what we were doing, to be honest, on the programmatic side. This is the first time we've ever, ever um, attempted to do a transportation options program. So we started out with some um, intense planning around how we would actually do this um, Smart Trips program. And on the food side, they were looking more deeply into the food system in this particular part of Austin. Um, once we kind of had a handle on how we were going to do things, uh, then we uh, engaged in some pretty intense community outreach. And in some of the lessons learned, I'll share more. Um, but uh, this was probably the hallmark of our of our work uh, in the community. Um, the outreach was ex extremely intense, and it it really demanded um, a lot of us in building relationships and um, sustaining those throughout the the program. And we 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 were successful and um, less successful um, in, you know, depending on um, some of the aspects of the program. So there's a lot to share um, in how to sort of build and sustain relationships from a um, city role. So, you know, I think for the folks on the call that represent city governments, um, probably doesn't come as any surprise to you that it's, it can be very difficult to um, be sort of agile and nimble with the community, be responsive, and be um, as present as you need to to really build those relationships. Often, in my experience anyway, uh, nonprofits, community-based nonprofits can be um, extremely good partners in really extending the resources of the city into the community in ways that the city just is not well equipped to do. Um, and that certainly was something we learned um, through our process. But um, the community outreach strategies that we used uh, involved um, a, just a whole lot of community engagement at existing um, events, uh, tabling at uh, certain cultural festivals and other, um, other gatherings, neighborhood association meetings and the like, as well as standing up our own um, engagement programs around walking, biking, and transit and encouraging existing groups to take advantage of those, pro of those programs. On the food side, in terms of our community outreach strategies, uh, it was actually 
a really a successful um, partnership with the University of Texas's um, public um, policy school, the LBJ school. Uh, the Edwin's team recruited a number of students and trained them on how to conduct uh, focus groups and other outreach with the community around the food system. And they did a whole lot of focus groups. I think over uh, 600 people were involved in that effort. And on um, the active living side, we uh, had um, a reach of over 27,000, but um, in terms of the depth, really um, worked very, very closely with about 315 households out of that um, kind of blanket approach to um, getting the word out. And uh, then in terms of just how we um, really got into the um, meat and potatoes of our program, um, from the planning side on, on the blue boxes there, the uh, food systems um, approach really looked at getting developing a plan that would uh, help to identify ways to increase access to healthy food. And that has really led to um, some exciting work citywide around food, um, food access. And from the programmatic side on um, for active transportation, we were focused on um, getting a number of, of resources out to the community that would encourage them to use active transportation and get, thereby get um, more physical activity day to day. Uh, so moving on, I'll talk a little bit about the um, coalitions. I think that was of most um, interest to, um, to the folks uh, putting this together. But we had um, kind of a, you know, underpinned by the resources made available through the American Public Health Association and some of the technical expertise uh, made available through the American, um, uh, well, resources from American Planning and then uh, technical expertise from American Public Health Association. We um, really built sort of a three-part um, coalition. The community partners included um, many of our local high schools and elementary school contacts for things like um, meeting venues, uh, for um, parent-teacher uh, types of engagement, um, volunteer groups, any, any way that we could work with the community, uh, especially on the active living side, to act, um, you know, get in, uh, engagement from student populations um, for, uh, for the physical activity side of things. And then we also uh, worked a lot with neighborhood associations. That's a very common um, way that people organize here in Austin. And then we, um, as I mentioned, worked very closely with the University of Texas students. And also um, some key partners, institutional partners in the particular neighborhood we were working with included the YMCA. They have a beautiful recreation center up there that became really a hub for a lot of our community-based programs. Um, Goodwill of Central Texas offers uh, one of the only places that one can get a GED if they're over um, 26 years old. There's kind of a peculiarity in the law here in Texas, um, and the Goodwill offers a really essential um, service to people that are really trying to establish um, good paying jobs and meaningful careers uh, who have, you know, for whatever circumstance, didn't get a high school diploma. Um, the other part of our coalition included um, let's see if I can advance this. Oh, there we go. Um, our city of Austin partners. So this was a very um, robust uh, city department led uh, effort. We had um, our staff from Health and Human Services. The medical director of the city of Austin was a key partner. In fact, attended many of the plan for health engagements that were made available to us as a coalition. Of course, Austin Transportation Office of Sustainability, as previously mentioned, myself and Edwin Marty and our teams. Our Parks and Recreation staff were um, extremely supportive and helpful in the food access component in our planning and zoning, public works, um, capital planning, and our police departments also played a big role um, in, in uh, moving the, the, all, the entire program forward. And then outside of the city, um, we, we did quite a bit with our transit agency to encourage um, use of of uh, transit and um, worked a lot with health clinics and social service agencies to convene uh, meetings where a lot of their clients would be uh, already um, present. I'm going to move along, talk a little bit more about the Smart Trip side of things. This is really um, nearest and dearest to my heart because this was the work that my team did, um, but we really created our, a fully bilingual um, transportation options program that um, created very customized uh, maps 
and walks and mobility guides and safety brochures um, really focused on active modes. And those are distributed to um, 315 uh, households. We had over 5,000 pieces of um, literature or safety um, devices, lights, pedometers, things like that, that were delivered to households. And those were delivered by a community nonprofit called Bike Austin that we partnered with, um, which turned out to be a great way for them to um, build uh, a relationship with uh, that this part of town and households in this part of town. As to our overall outcomes, we experienced a 2.2 percent um, average relative decrease in driving trips. Um, and 44% of our program participants actually did decrease their driving trips in some fashion. We had an 11.8% average relative increase in active trips, um, meaning uh, we had, you know, be between the um, folks trips taking trips before and after, we had about 11.8% increase. So that was really exciting for us. And um, of all of our program participants, um, you know, 15% increased their active trips. And then 75% um, of our folks. Uh, uh, said that they felt that their knowledge of transportation options increased, which was one of our um, sub-objectives, I guess you'd say, in the um, in the active living side of our work. And so overall, it was a great experience. And we have since moved on to do smart trips in other parts of the city, taking the lessons learned from this program. Uh, as I mentioned a couple of times, just wanted to reinforce um, really having the city work in an area that has a lot of health disparities and a lot of need um, was extremely challenging. Uh, we really overcame that by uh, establishing community partnerships with um, nonprofits that either had a direct interest in, in becoming more um, established in the community or were already established. And that has led to some really exciting um, and sustaining um, efforts. So for example, um, the photograph that you see there of the young woman on bicycles, um, that was a program that was initiated by one of our community partners uh, called the Gisalo Cycling Initiative. And uh, they have since established a bicycle um, hub, they call it. It's a shipping container converted into a bicycle um, shop in a place that you know, doesn't have a bicycle shop for miles. And that continues to offer um, places for kids to keep their bikes maintained, as well as has a fleet of bikes for kids to use on a trail network um, that is right there at the recreation center. Um, that's just one of many, many things that continue to um, serve the community that we were in um, from an active living perspective. And then from the, um, from the food system side, uh, the our city council actually passed a policy to call for the work that was done in North Austin um, to be done throughout the city. So there's some really exciting work uh, being done um, in Austin to really better understand the food network and, um, and how we access it. And in particular, my team is focused on supporting that through physical infrastructure, so sidewalks, bike lanes, and things like that. So I'm going to end there and turn it back over to the presenters to um, kick off the Q&A. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you, Carla. So we're going to hand it over to Anna and the APA team in just a moment to open it up to the full group for some reflections, discussion, and questions. First, we just sort of wanted to bring it back to the topic that we are addressing today, which is assessing the healthy communities landscape. And I think both Carla and Laura really spoken about some key questions that come up in assessments in interesting ways. One thing, you know, speaking at a chapter level for APA chapters, an assessment might look different than, for example, a community-based project assessment would. So your planners for health assessment may not be the same sort of charrette assessment that you may do um, in your day job. One thing we would like to sort of queue up for people is the notion of looking for levers of opportunity in the systems that you're working in. I think Carla spoke to this really nicely when talking about how the Public Health Alliance of Southern California saw that there were levers of opportunity 
in regional transportation plans and processes and that by bringing really strong health data and metrics that they could influence transportation decision makers to build health concepts into their ongoing work. And I think, you know, as Laura just described, in Austin a lever of opportunity that they saw, the Plan for Health Coalition saw, was that in the communities that were experiencing the greatest inequities, there were already strong community-based organizations and that the coalition could help dedicate some of its resources and time by building partnerships with those existing community-based organizations who could then bring community residents to the table to share their perspectives. So what those levers of opportunity are in the specific context you're working in at your chapter level and even in your day-to-day -day work in healthy planning, those are going to depend on the context. But we just wanted to mention that as a way to be thinking about going into your planners for health assessment to really you know, be asking the question of what are those health issues affecting your population and who's most impacted why are things the way they are? You know, what are those underlying determinants of health that have led to these issues? And who then needs to be involved in changing those conditions? Who's already working on this? Who has strong relationships and alliances? Who can bring those community perspectives that may be missing from the process? And as we move forward in future Planners for Health conversations and sessions, we're going to start to get into some questions about what's in it for those different partners and how do you build those strong partnerships and expand into maybe some new sectors and uh, bring new perspectives to the table. So you've heard a lot from um, a, a lot of us, and we are looking forward to really um, broadening this dialogue and discussion. So maybe Anna will hand it over to you um, to get us going on that part. Sure, yes, thanks. Um, looking forward to having some folks uh, call in or chat in your questions in the question box on the right that if you haven't seen yet, feel free to chat a question to us. Um, and if possible, you might have uh, be able to see an audio piece that you can use to unmute yourself and um, or raise your hand and we can unmute you uh, so that you could actually speak on the call. Uh, we, ha we still have uh, over 200 folks <clears throat> in the room with us, so that's um, been wonderful that we've had so many people. I also say welcome to those who are from uh, not part formally in the Planners for Health program or Plan for Health, but uh, are joining us to learn more about projects, how you can lessons in your own work. So we want to hear from everyone uh, about what you're thinking. But I do have uh, one question, Carla or Laura both um, answer this question, and it's about, uh, you know, when you're thinking about, when you're kind of developing your program, trying to figure out what was currently going on in your community, both of you sort of referred to it, but didn't get into the details of discovered what other existing efforts um, could be linked with your own goals, and maybe Carla could go first, and then Laura to talk a little bit about how you, how did you do the outreach to find those programs and find those people who are working on um, related efforts. Hi, uh, this is Carla, and I think part of uh, what was fortunate for us is because we are a network of health departments, um, a lot of our health departments have their own healthy uh, communities planning efforts where they aggregate, um, bring together partners from their member cities uh, talking about healthy um, about healthy communities. So um, that was a place where we started. Yeah, and I'll add, um, oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we um, we really benefited, and I think this is a testament to how APA and APHA sought to kind of pool resources and leverage the power of professionals in public health and planning. Um, but we really, we had the benefit of the work that our public health department had done on health disparities around the city to know that the particular area that we were looking at was um, had high degree of need, and our transit agency planners had been the um, really the pioneers in wanting to bring a transportation options program to the city. So, um, and then as far as the community-based work, that was really um, something that we, um, I, I to be honest, rather clumsily um, uh, stumbled to in. Um, 
not really appreciating just how many uh, organizations were um, working in the area, how some of them had a good reputation and some didn't, and aligning with those that, or not uh, aligning with the right folks, and also um, appreciating that even if someone had a sort of a rough reputation, for example, unfortunately our police op department was doing some really good work um, funded by the um, Department of Justice, but it was, you know, it was it's hard work to do, and they had some um, community uh, relations issues to navigate, and so we just we had to really um, learn that a bit the hard way, and um, really throw ourselves into some intense um, community building to um, help to establish our kind of where this coalition it could fit within the mix of, of folks that were already there and just appreciating that there was great work going on and not to step on those toes but to be um, supportive um, of what was already going on and appreciate that our public health professionals and, and transit planners had um, led us to the right place but um, really once we got there we needed to really build those community-based um, relationships. And then I would say we also brought people, brought, brought organizations to the community that were working elsewhere. Um, in our world, we deal a lot with the bicycle and pedestrian advocacy community, and those folks really didn't have a foothold quite yet in North Austin. And so through this Plan for Health effort, we were able to bring um, those organizations to North Austin, and they remain very active in those areas today, which I think is part of a successful sustainability strategy and getting community-based nonprofits the resources they need to really continue to do their mission-driven work. Thank you for those answers. That's really, um, it's really neat to hear uh, the leadership from public health and, and the outreach to planning and, and also leveraging existing work. Um, one of our folks has raised his hand, Barry Klein. I've just unmuted you if you want to speak. Barry? Well, we're still uh, we're still learning our technology here a little bit. <laughs> um, we do have another oh. question from. Oh, hello. Yes. Hi, Barry. You can go ahead. Oh, hi. Great. Um, so I had a question uh, on the with the first speaker. Somebody had some real interesting quantified uh, percentages of um, reduced chronic diseases, and I was wondering, are those just general statistics, or were you able to figure those out on a local level? And if so, how did you do that? Yeah, hi, this is Carla Blackmar. Those statistics are um, those are using a tool called ISIM, which is uh, something that we would be happy to uh, include that perhaps can be sent out to the group. But um, it is actually a model that is a relative risk model that looks at the risk of physical, act physical inactivity and then for increased amounts of physical activity spread ac across the population, what the likely reduction in chronic disease rates are based on whichever increased scenario you, uh, you choose. And so for that particular scenario, they chose a very um, aggressive increase in active transportation um, to meet the carbon reduction goals for San Francisco. And so those are local numbers that um, come from a projected scenario for that area. And you can use the ISIM tool, it exists as a spreadsheet, to do similar projections in your community. And um, if you're clever with data, you can also calibrate it based on what you know about your existing community's active transportation level. Excellent, thank you. So another, um, it was uh, cool to hear that both Laura and Carla talked a little bit about healthcare. Um, there was a question about what is the role of healthcare organizations in your coalition. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about that. Either Carla or Laura, or both. Uh, this is Carla. I'll start just briefly, and I'll say that um, one of the things that we're very interested in moving towards is working with our hospitals and our community um, healthcare foundations to connect an existing source of funding that they have called community benefit dollars that comes from their required IRS reporting if they're a nonprofit hospital to um, 
to really start to connect that funding, which is meant to improve community health, to some of the types of built environment projects uh, that we're interested in promoting, and so things like active transportation promotion. And so we're increasingly partnering with um, some of our uh, organizations of healthcare systems and hospitals to begin to talk about how to make that funding really work for prevention. Um, and I would say that that's the primary way in which we, we are currently working with healthcare delivery. Yeah, uh, could you repeat the question? This is, was that, did I get it right that you're looking for um, how, we're, how we're working with health healthcare delivery organizations? Yeah, how, exactly, mm -hmm. yep. And, and as, are they part of your coalition or are you uh, working with them in some other way? Yeah, I can speak mostly to our work in active transportation, um, not so much into the food systems part of it, but um, from an active transportation side, we um, have been focused on, um, through our Vision Zero program, working with our um, healthcare providers on hospital utilization data and other, um, other data sources to really better understand both um, folks that are um, being cited for traffic um, violations and involved in crashes and, and the victims as well. Um, so that's really where the interface is with our team um, from a traffic safety perspective. And it's, it's um, seeming to point to some very a much richer understanding of traffic safety from a public health perspective. Um, that didn't necessarily grow out of our Plan for Health Coalition. Uh, well, actually, I take that back. Uh, it, we're, it actually did in that, you know, through the Plan for Health work that we did, um, the relationships with uh, the, the Austin Public Health Department as well as all of their um, community, uh, the coalition of partners that they've assembled um, really helps uh, helped us to know who to go to once our Vision Zero efforts got underway. And for folks who might not be aware, that's really looking at traffic safety from a public health perspective and figuring out how to um, eventually eliminate um, serious injury and fat fatal, fatal um, traffic-related um, crashes uh, over a, you know, in our case, we're ho hoping to do that over a 10-year period. And this is Rachel Bennett from Prevention Institute. I wanted to underscore that healthcare systems and hospitals and providers can and should see themselves as a part of these efforts, you know, particularly when we're talking about changing community conditions like land use or transportation or food systems. They influence these conditions in many ways. Oftentimes hospitals and health systems, they're major landowners or developers. They are employers in the community, they're service providers certainly, but they're also trip generators in transportation speak. So many people come and go from healthcare facilities. They also procure supplies and foods and they make investments in the community in the form of community benefits investments if they're a nonprofit hospital or healthcare system. So I think a great place to start if you're not already working with healthcare partners is to reach out to community benefit departments or other folks who are already working on community health and prevention side of things and see what they're interested in and what they might be able to bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, we had another uh, participant raise her hand, Helen Burdock. Uh, I've unmuted you so you can speak. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes? Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm a, a planner that works in a, a rural county in New York State um, that is second to last um, in the health rankings according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, so we're starting to work with a, a coalition of partners to um, address trying to move that needle, um, so to speak. Uh, we're second to last only to the Bronx but we are in a very rural area. Um, so I guess I, I have sort of two questions. Um, number one is uh, we've gone through the coalition building process and we're now in the process of sort of identifying the low hanging fruit of you know, what we can actually do to make a difference in our health statistics. Um, and it seems kind of overwhelming. So um, the second webinar may be helpful when you discuss metrics, but I, I just have a general question of how do you figure out where to start and, and where to focus your efforts initially. Um, and then the second part of my question is just anecdotally without the data to back it up, we identified transportation um, really as, as an issue and the low hanging fruit. Um, but we were focusing on access to care and not necessarily active transportation. And I just wanted to know 
based on your experience, you know, any of the things that you did transportation related in an urban area like Austin, Texas, is, is that transferable to a rural area that, that really has no public transportation, you know, network, not a lot of sidewalks, that kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, and congratulations on the tough work of building the coalition. I mean, just knowing you have all willing partners coming to the table is not ever to be underestimated. Um, I would just offer that um, you know, you know, you know, you have a, you've identified the problem you want to solve, and if it is access to care, um, you know, I would say where we found the most success is looking at really best practice around the country and then trying to translate it for Austin and that would be where I'd say to start. So it might not be an active transportation solution. It might be some kind of paratransit or some other, um, you know, what have rural communities done well. I actually come from the Hawaiian Islands or originally and I know rural health access is a huge issue. In fact, there's associations devoted to it. So I'd be happy to put you in touch with some of my former colleagues. Um, if they can be of help in some of the strategies that they embrace. But I would just say there's got to be someone who's figured out something you know, as, that's working well and to comb the, um, your networks to find that and then figure out how will you would apply that using your coalition's resources. And perhaps that seems too basic, but um, it's really trying to build on what others have learned and, um, and focusing on the problem you have at hand. Great. And I would just add to that, um, you know, I think that it is extremely difficult, and especially in rural environments, to come up with some of these solutions or, you know, I think it's important to both listen to your community and see, you know, what's of the highest priority to them in terms of improving their health, and, and they will likely know uh, if you go out and survey them or get their input through other means. And also to, you know, active transportation is not always a solution for everyone and triaging your approach, you know, if there's an issue accessing healthcare to begin with, you know, starting with that is a, a really important step. Great, thank you. Yes, and, and this is Anna, and um, we have had a number of uh, rural communities as part of Plan for Health, um, some of whom are working on physical activity, uh, others working on food access, so our Ajo, Arizona, Community, our uh, Eastern Highlands, Connecticut, which is sort of sort of near you in, in New York State, uh, and also Shawano and Menominee counties in Wisconsin are all very rural areas that we're working on solutions for um, in Plan for Health. So if you look at our website, which I can plug now, plan the number four health, planforhealth.us, uh, you can see more information about those three communities um, across the two cohorts. Uh, it's under coalitions on that website. Um, and you can also contact us for more information as well. We have some resources that we can share about uh, how uh, taking Laura's suggestion to um, look at what some other places are, have done and uh, see if you can adapt it to your community. But that's a great question. It's one of the challenges that we hear about frequently is how to adapt these kinds of strategies in less populous areas. Um, I have one more question uh, from Jess Lynch that's come in on our chat box. Um, she says, you mentioned opportunity levers, and that seems like a good component to include in our assessment that uh, she's actually working on a Planners for Health project. What approaches or tools do you uh, take to identifying opportunity levers? For the speakers, are there particular levers on the horizon that you would recommend the rest of us think about as we embark on our Planners for Health project? It's also a broad question, but um, any thoughts that you have to share, or Rachel and Sandra? Yeah, great, um, great question. Thank you, Jess. Um, so I think what we would add here, this is Sandra from Prevention Institute, um, is that there is um, just, I think, a treasure trove of, of different types of um, resources and frameworks and tools that can really help you think about the um, needs and opportunities um, within you know, the sort of range or communities that you're working with. I know for Prevention Institute, because we really think that um, the sort of community determinants of health, um, you know, safety, transportation, parks and open space, um, 
food that's sold and promoted in neighborhoods, um, access to education, et cetera, are where you can both push back against these broader structural drivers um, and still have an impact at a population level or community level that um, tools and frameworks that identify levers, as you mentioned there, um, are incredibly important. So one that we've helped to um, develop and disseminate um, is one called um, Thrive, uh, which is tool for health, resilience, and vulnerable environments. We'll be happy to send that out to this entire group that really sort of identifies those community uh, conditions and determinants and can help you think about um, how to prioritize that in, in the context that you're working with. And there's a bit of like an assessment and prioritization that can go um, along with it and that might be helpful um, for your group to consider. Um, so we'll send that out and then just kind of continue to think about um, some of those tools and frameworks um, because I think you're totally right about seizing the policy and the uh, levers and, and those platforms um, that are really ripe in your community. Yeah, this is Laura. I think just appreciating the concept of levers of opportunity is is really empowering. Um, and ever you'll see, you know, you know them when you see them. <laughs> probably to some extent, because every context and community is different. Um, but um, I just, off the top of my head, just thought about sort of funding and and understanding what how you pull those levers. So, for example, in my role at the city, just you know, understanding the procurement process, understanding the budget process, the seasonal aspect of budgeting, um, the influencers that you need to um, leverage or, you know, access to resource the actions that you're identifying would be probably a, one way to think about using levers of opportunity from a resourcing or funding perspective and appreciating that it might take time, but that if you understand the system how to pull the levers, you can hopefully, you know, expect to see those, uh, th that funding come forward in some fashion. I think, and then from a policy perspective, you know, we, I can just, in watching my colleagues at the Office of Sustainability really successfully pilot district-based food planning, um, offer that as a, as a um, process to the city council and then having the city council uh, ask for that for the whole entire city was it was really um, inspiring and now we're working as partners to find ways for example how we can help to you know fund sidewalks that help people access major food retailers that offer healthy options better so it it has really deepened our relationship with our colleagues that are doing this food access research and how we from a transportation perspective support that um, and then I think the levers opportunity that the community offers in articulating their needs um, is another one to really better understand and and figure out how to pace yourself so you don't burn out, but um, hear those needs and then translate that into um, programs or policies or or um, plans that that start to move um, forward towards solutions. And so that can always be tricky because there's such amazing amounts of need and you can't pull all those levers uh, at once but um, being selective and strategic about what you do take on and do it well and then move to the next is um, I guess just it can be a tried and true approach. So. This is Rachel from Prevention Institute. I wanted to offer one quick additional thought on this which is sometimes an important lever of opportunity is um, as Laura was just saying to see something through well so to implement well um, I'm a trained planner and I love planning things and then when it comes to implementation it's not always under our purview in the same way but for example one community that we've worked in um, worked really hard to get a strong parks policy on the books at the county level and it will um, give a set aside of funding to communities that were identified as being high need for park access and now the challenge is to make sure that the policy is implemented in the way it was designed and to make sure that funds are spent first and most intensively in those communities that were identified as high needs. That's something that's going to require um, 
the watchful participation of advocates, of strong agency staff, of coalitions. So it may be that as you're thinking about what you would like to work on at your chapter, you may want to look at what's already in the pipeline and making sure that those things are implemented in ways that really do push through on the health and equity results. That's great. Thank you so much for, for the in-depth answers to that. And, um, and actually following up on Laura's question, uh, Laura's uh, comments about looking at assets in neighborhoods uh, and particularly on the food system side, I noticed that you had um, a mapping element. That's a very planning activity to sort of map some of the assets in neighborhoods. Could you just talk briefly about what um, that was to create maps of neighborhood assets? Sure, and I'm speaking a little bit um, secondhand because a lot of the food mapping was done by uh, our Office of Sustainability, but what they did was look at all of the food permits and, of, of all kinds and started there uh, in terms of mapping and then refined that to understand the quality of the food um, retail itself. Um, and then as a complementary effort, you know, we provided, or yeah, complementary effort, we provided like, sidewalk um, layers in GIS so that you could see from an accessibility standpoint for walking the um, ways that those food retailers were were um, the paths of travel I guess you'd say and then we added transit um, service and bike bicycle facilities um, and that is work that we're still trying to do at a citywide level to better understand um, physically, you know, the infrastructure and where um, food retail is. And then on the other side of it, you know, seeing where we know there are food deserts and where um, food retail can be better, um, we, you know, where we need to invest in it. And then in terms of mapping as, as a planning activity, we also did quite a bit of that in, on the active transportation side, um, just more for um, the purposes of showing people what routes they did have and then um, creating sort of value-added, I guess, mapping tools um, with specific routes that showed people how you could get from your home to the library or to, or to the store or to the rec center um, by walking or by bus or by bike. And I think just zooming out chapter level because we are, you know, representatives of a chapters here, thinking about what are those lessons learned on the community-based project level that could be transferable across different locales, and what are the skills and the capacities that were needed for folks at the table to really work together well. I think you know one opportunity that's so great through Planners for Health is that we get to come together as leaders of the field of healthy planning and share lessons about what has worked. Mm -hmm. Often, I think, at conferences and other opportunities, we tell each other what we did, and I think this gives us an opportunity to tell each other how we did it and what was really difficult and what worked really well, kind of what was that secret sauce um, to make the project work or that kept a project from working. And I think that as Planners for Health hubs and as state or regional chapter representatives, you can be a hub for holding that kind of information, exchanging it, and building that capacity within your chapter. Yes, that's completely right. Um, we have one more minute, and we have someone else raise their hand and to speak. Janice, if you want to ask your question, um, we have one minute left. Maybe Janice is not there anymore. Um, I I am here. Hello. Oh, good. There you are. Hi. Yeah, I I was just wondering if we would have access to the slides. Oh yes, of course. So that's actually a great wrap-up question. We will um, be sharing all of this information, and we did record the webinar as well. So we'll have an audio-visual recording of the webinar um, available for everyone. Um, right. I'm going to say thanks for joining us, and um, fabulous to have so many folks on the line today and hearing about Planners for Health and our work. Um, thank you to Sandra and uh, Rachel for uh, facilitating this and for and with Carla and for uh, sharing your expertise and um, lessons learned from the field um, from California and Texas respectively. 
wonderful to, uh, to hear about how it's actually working. Um, so please join us again next month for our webinar, uh, and uh, we will talk to you again soon. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.